welcome everybody to Christmas at Cedar Creek. I'm so excited that you're joining us today as we are officially kicking off the Christmas season. And whether you are connecting with us in person at one of our campuses or online, either way, I am just really glad that you're here. Or in the words of the great Clark W. Griswold, I hope this enhances your holiday spirit. Uh, the truth is, for us as Christians, Christmas is a great time of year. It's a time when we get to celebrate the thrill of hope that Jesus' birth brings to this weary world. We get to sing about the peace and the joy that Jesus brings to our individual lives. But, but I think the question is, is there more to Christmas than just a temporary lift in our collective moods, right? Is there more to Jesus' birth than just this story about a magic baby born in a manger with angels and shepherds and wise men and a star in a little town of Bethlehem? Is there more to what we are celebrating? Because I think sometimes as Christians, especially this time of year, we can get so focused on all the details surrounding the birth of Jesus that we forget that the Christmas story is really just one part of a much bigger story that God is writing across the pages of history and across the pages of our individual lives. Because what started in a cradle would ultimately lead to a cross. And what happened on that cross would ultimately lead to an eternal crown. And so over the next couple of weeks, as part of our Christmas celebration, what I want to do is try to help us connect the dots between Bethlehem and Calvary and eternity so that we can understand that we actually, as followers of Jesus, we can live in the thrill of hope all year long. You know, I find it interesting that Jesus never once asked us as his followers to remember or to celebrate his birth. He never called us to do that. In fact, we don't actually know the literal date that Jesus was born on. December 25th is sort of an arbitrary date that has been selected. Jesus didn't ask us to celebrate his birth, but he did ask us to remember his death and to celebrate his resurrection. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not the Grinch. I'm not saying that it's wrong for us to celebrate Christmas and that we shouldn't remember the story of Jesus' birth. I'm just saying that what Jesus' birth means is way more important than when it happened or how it happened. In fact, I think that may be the reason that two of the gospel writers, two of the four gospel writers were actually a part of Jesus' original 12 followers. And those two disciples, Matthew and John, when they wrote their gospel stories and when they told the story of Jesus' birth, they were real light on the details of what happened in Bethlehem but they were very strong on what happened in Bethlehem and how it affects our lives. Matthew puts it this way in Matthew 1, 23. He said, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. John's even shorter on the details. Notice what he writes in John 1, 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God, but then the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The biggest miracle of Christmas is not that a virgin gave birth or that angels sang to shepherds or that a star stood still over the town of Bethlehem. The greatest miracle of Christmas is that the God of the universe, motivated by his love for us, 
and his desire to rescue and redeem us would wrap himself in human flesh and enter the broken messiness of this world and of our lives. And that event would not only change the course of human history, but it changes the narrative of our daily lives. It changes everything through Jesus. And so today I kind of want to start off this Christmas series by just looking at one of the benefits of God with us. Because God is with us, it means his strength is available to us. As followers of Jesus, the supernatural strength of God is available in our daily lives. And I don't know anybody who couldn't use a little more strength in their lives, especially heading into these next three weeks, right? We need some strength. In fact, if you don't think that you need the supernatural strength of God, you ain't been shopping at Walmart this week. Or you haven't had out-of-town relatives come and stay for a while. We all need the strength of God. And so I want to talk about that and how we can access, receive God's strength for the daily stuff of life. But before I jump into that, I kind of want to start making sure we're all on the same page. Kind of building a foundation. Two key truths we need to understand about God. One, we need to understand that God is a powerful God. Our God is a powerful God. The Bible says that God is omnipotent, which is just a fancy theological way of saying he is all-powerful. There is nothing that God cannot do. The only limits that God has are the limits he chooses to put on himself. If God doesn't do something, it's not because he doesn't have the power to do it. It's because he chooses not to do it. God is a powerful God. I think most of us would say, yeah, duh, thank you, Captain Obvious. That's why he's God. He's got the power. That's why we worship him as God. I think the question we wrestle with is, how does that help me? I'm glad God doesn't have any limits and has all the power he needs, but what about my life? And that leads to the second key truth we know, need to understand about God, and that is not only is he a powerful God, but he is also an empowering God. Our God is an empowering God. He wants to share his power with us. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 29. It's a poem written by King David about the power of God. If you've never read Psalm 29, I want to encourage you this week, take some time and read it. It's so short. It's only 11 verses long, but it's this beautiful poetic picture of just how powerful our God is. David paints some beautiful word pictures. David said, God is so powerful that, that his voice thunders over the ocean and shakes the wilderness. That God is so powerful that just a whisper from his voice can shatter the giant cedar trees in Lebanon. David says that the sound of God's voice, the mountains around Lebanon, these 9,000 foot massive mountains, at the sound of of God's voice, those mountains jump and skip and hop around like a young calf or colt on a cold winter morning. It's all about God's power. But then in the very last line of the poem, David kind of drops a surprise. Notice what he says, Psalm 29, 11. He says, the Lord gives strength to who? What does that say? his people. That is us. We are, you are God's people. As followers of Jesus, we are a part of his family, and he gives his power to his people. And then look at the rest of the verse. He says, the Lord blesses his people with peace. Do you see the connection between God's strength and our peace? You see that connection? It made me think this week when I was rereading that verse about our 
military strategy during the Cold War. Do you remember what the U.S. strategy was during the Cold War? It was peace through strength. You remember that? The more strength we have, the more likely we are to have global peace, right? And I think that's what David is saying, that, that peace is not the absence of problems in our lives. It's the presence of God's strength to deal with and walk through those problems. It comes from God's strength. And so that got me thinking, like, where do I need God's strength? What kind of problems in my life require the supernatural strength of God? Well, I could make a long list, but I broke it up into three categories. These are the three areas where I need God's strength in my life. They might match up for you. You might have your own list. But the first category I came up with is that I need God's strength for uncontrollable circumstances. I need God's strength for uncontrollable circumstances in my life. And the truth is, so much of our lives are beyond our control, aren't they? Don't you deal with uncontrollable circumstances? And that may be as simple as being stuck in traffic while you're out Christmas shopping or, or missing a flight or a flight being canceled when you're flying home to see family, or it may be much bigger. It may be an unexpected diagnosis. It may be losing a job or a financial crisis. But I need God's strength for these uncontrollable circumstances in my life. A second area where I need God's strength is the uncooperative people in my life. Any of you got some of those, those uncooperative people? People who just kind of won't get with the program. They're, they kind of always are, are creating drama where no drama exists. You might spend some time with some of those people, i.e. extended family in your life. You might be the uncooperative person. I don't know. But we need God's strength to deal with uncontrollable circumstances, uncooperative people. And this last one is really difficult, and that is unexplainable pain unexplainable pain. I need God's strength for that. Look, some of the pain that I go through in my life is understandable. I know why I'm going through it. Maybe it's because of some bad, unwise decisions that I made. Maybe it's some bad decisions that somebody else made, and we're just having to deal with the consequences. But sometimes we go through pain in our life, and it seems like it happened for no reason whatsoever. That it's hard to understand why we're going through it. What is the purpose, right? How could God allow this? Why me? That's that unexplainable pain, and we need God's strength to get through those things in our lives. And the good news is Christmas means we have access to it. We can have it. And so I want to just briefly share with you what I think are four keys to receiving God's strength in your life. Four keys to have God's strength. Number one, to, to receive God's strength, I must take ownership of my faith. If I want God's strength in my life, then I have to take ownership of my faith because faith don't come through osmosis. You're not going to get faith from just hanging out around people of faith, right? I, I, don't, I don't care how many times you come in here or watch online and you hear me say with all sincerity and passion and love that God loves you and that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. No matter how much I believe it until you truly believe it. Until you settle that in your own heart, you're going to struggle to experience God's strength in your life. Did you know that electricity was universally available in the United States by the mid-1930s? Uh, because of FDR's Rural Electrification Act, Electricity in the 1930s was no longer just limited to cities and metropolitan areas. Small towns, rural communities, farms. By 1936, electricity was universally available across almost all the United States. 
But did you know that it would not be until the mid-1960s that it was universally used across the United States? There were large numbers of people who had access to electrical power. Their houses were wired. The outlets were there. Everything was available. And yet they still chose to light with kerosene candles, to heat with wood in their fireplace, and to cook on wood burning stoves, even though they could have accessed the convenience of electricity right there. Why did they not use the power that was available to them? Probably for some, it was fear. You know, I don't know, is this going to work? The mistrust of this new technology. But I think for a lot of them, they were just stuck in the same old ways of doing it. Even though they could have plugged in the lamp, they were just more comfortable. It made more sense to them to buy kerosene and to light a lantern or to, to cook on the stove. And I think a lot of us kind of do that in life. We have God's power available, but we're just so used to trying to do everything in our power that we keep doing it the same way and somehow thinking that that's going to change. We're going to get some kind of different results. But we don't. We keep ending up flat on our face because we just kind of show up every now and then and sing a few church songs and fill out an outline and maybe go to a home group and maybe give a little money to the clean water offering, but we don't really own the details of our faith. Look at what Jesus says, Matthew 17. He says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, then you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You see that? It's not about the size of your faith. It's about the fact that it's your faith, that you're actually willing to trust God, to try out his promises in your life. You know, one of the things I love about the Bible is the honesty with which it treats its heroes. All other ancient writings, take particularly the, the writings of Rome and all these writings about the great Caesars, those writers intentionally left out the flaws and failures and weaknesses of their leaders. They painted these Pharaoh's is almost godlike with almost no imperfections. And yet you read the Bible and you see the exact opposite. The Bible scrupulously shines the light on the weaknesses of its heroes. Why? Why would the Bible do that? It's because the purpose of the Bible is to show us God's power, not how strong people are. It's about God's power and God's glory, not how good, cool, strong, or close to Jesus the people we read about are. The only difference between you and the people like Moses and David and Peter and James and John and Paul, the only difference between you and them is the level of their trust in and obedience to God, their willingness to own their faith for themselves. How personal is your faith? How real is your faith in your daily life? When you face an issue, when you face a problem, do you, you get before God and beg for a strength? Do you pray? Do you seek out to live out your faith? Because until you do, you're going to struggle to feel God's strength in your life. Number two, the second thing I have to do to receive God's strength is I have to admit my total need. I have to admit my total need. Until I recognize my complete and total need for God's power, I'm going to struggle to experience his strength in my life. I mean, here's the thing. I know you guys. Most of us, we recognize our need for the supernatural strength of God in the big stuff right? We, we pray. We know we need God. We know we can't handle the uncontrollable circumstances. We know we need God's strength with the uncooperative people that we have to be patient with. We know we need God's strength to get through that unexplainable pain that just overwhelms us. That's when we cry out to God, 
because we know we're in over our heads. But that's not the only time we need God's strength in our lives. I love what the Bible says in 1 Chronicles verse six, chapter 16. It says, depend on the Lord and his strength when? Always go to him for help. It doesn't say reach out for God's strength when you're climbing a big mountain, when you're dealing with a major life crisis. Always go to God and depend on him for his strength. Here's where this gets really cool. You know who wrote those words? David. King David, right? The the shepherd boy who killed a giant, who went on to be this great king, right? He wrote those words. You know why? Because he knew he needed God's strength when as a little kid he stood in front of a nine-foot giant with a spear. He knew he needed God's strength. But one night on the roof of his palace, he tried to manage his own lust as he watched his neighbor's wife take a bath. And he tried to manage it in his own strength. And it all fell apart. It shattered his family. It shattered his legacy as a king. Why? Because he thought, I can handle it. I need God for the big giants, but I don't need him for the little daily stuff. No, you don't. You need God's strength for every circumstance. The problem is we just don't recognize our needs sometimes until it's too late. That's why in the New Testament, Paul, the apostle Paul, right, probably the strongest, most productive Christ follower in all of human history. I mean, he planted most of the churches across the known world, spread the gospel all over the place, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and in spare time endured tremendous suffering, right, and abuse just for believing in Jesus. And yet as strong as Paul was, look at what he writes, 2 Corinthians 12. He says, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. Why? Why would anybody boast about their weaknesses? Look at what he says. So that the power of Christ can work through me. God's power and God's strength shows up when we finally get to the end of ourselves. So how far you got to go to finally get to the end of you? How much has to fall apart? How much has to be damaged and destroyed before you finally set your pride aside and say, this life is bigger than me. Jesus, I need your strength. That's when his strength shows up, when I admit my total need. And then number three, the third thing I need to do to receive God's strength is I have to align my life with God's purposes. I have to align my life with God's purposes. You remember when we started this message, I started with two key truths, right? That God is a powerful God, but he is also an empowering God, that he wants us to have his power in our lives, but understand he wants us to use his power his way, not ours. Some of you are old enough to remember that great old country song, looking for love where? Don't you think you guys should be listening to Christian music instead of that trashy country radio station? Yeah. Look, when it comes to God's strength, the problem isn't that we're looking for it in all the wrong places. A lot of times the the problem is we want it for all the wrong reasons. Right? God's power, God's strength is, is not some universal outlet for me to plug into and use it for whatever I want. God is not my genie in the bottle whose power is under my control to meet my wishes. God is the God of the universe, and he has a purpose, and he has a plan, and it's bigger than just what I think I want in any moment. And so the more I will align my life with his plan, with his purposes, the more I will align my passion for the passions of his kingdom, not my little kingdom, the more I will align my life, my desires, my purposes, and my passions 
with his purposes, the more of his power will show up in my life. Jesus put it this way in John 15. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Maybe, maybe the reason you're not experiencing God's power in your life is because you're trying to be your own vine and grow your own fruit. God's power, his strength follows his purposes, not mine. And then finally, number four, the fourth thing I need to do to receive God's power is I have to act as if I have it already. To act as if I have it already. Because here's the thing. Rarely does God give us his strength before we need it. Look, in the 30 plus years I've been following Jesus, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I felt God's strength before I stepped out in faith. But I have thousands and thousands of stories where God's strength showed up after I stepped out in faith. I can look back across the pages of the history of my life and see where God faithfully showed up with his strength after I trusted him enough to step out even when I didn't have it. See, most of the time, it's not until I act in obedience that his strength will show up. See, some of you th are waiting and you're praying and you're asking God to give you his strength and you think you're waiting on his strength to show up. He's waiting for you to step out and trust him before you even feel that strength. I have a good pastor friend of mine. He, he says, when it comes to following Jesus, sometimes you got to just fake it till you feel it. <laughs> sometimes you just got to act like you got his strength, right? When you don't even feel it. But really, it's not faking it. It's faithing it, right? Just stepping out in faith, acting in obedience regardless to what I feel right now. Because I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Most of the things God calls you to do don't feel comfortable. <laughs> Usually obedience to God, rarely is obedience to God easy. It's always difficult. It's always swimming upstream, especially in the culture and world we're living in today, right? And God makes it that way not to punish us or not to make us prove that we're worthy of his strength. He does it because he cares more about our faith than our accomplishments. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. You may remember several months ago, y'all remember in the spring our No Greater Love series where we talked about sacrificial love. You might remember we talked about Mary, the mother of Jesus, this teenage girl just doing her thing in Nazareth, getting ready, planning a wedding. And an angel shows up and tells her she's not only going to have a child, but this child is going to be the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior of the world. And you remember Mary's response, pretty natural. A lot of confusion, a lot of questions, like, I don't know how, I don't have the strength to do this. How's this going to work out? What's Joe going to say? What the people in Nazareth going to do? This, you know, out of wedlock pregnancy. They don't go over real well in, in this culture. All of these questions... She didn't feel God's strength to do it. But in the midst of all that confusion and questions, do you remember what Mary ultimately said? She said, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. She's like, I don't think I got the strength. I don't think I'm the right person. But I am willing to step out in obedience. Probably the best picture of this anywhere is 33 years after that first Christmas. As Jesus moved from the cradle towards the cross. And you remember that last night in the Garden of Gethsemane, alone, he's crying out to God. He knows what he's facing the suffering, the beatings, the crucifixion his father turning his back because he is taking on the sin of the world. He knows all of that, and the, the stress is so much, he's literally sweating drops of blood. 
And you remember what he prayed? Notice Matthew 29. He prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. What's he saying? I don't think I have the strength. I don't feel the strength. I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can be obedient. He didn't feel the strength of God. But do you remember the very next line of his prayer? Look at what it says. Yet not as I will, but as you will. There's probably not one person in here today or watching online that's not facing some kind of struggle in your life right now. In the next three weeks, the holiday season is going to take that struggle and it's going to turn up the volume 100%. Emotions that you're able to keep at bay all year long just have a way of bubbling up to the surface. And not only is the emotional level going to go up, but the exhaustion level is going to go up. And as your pastor, I want you to know I am so sorry for that struggle. I'm sorry that you're facing whatever it is you're facing. But I also want you to know I believe with all my heart that God somehow supernaturally brought you here to connect with this message today because he wants you to know that struggle, that uncontrollable circumstance, that uncooperative person, that unexplainable pain is a great opportunity for you to experience God's strength in your life. The good news of Christmas is that God is with you. The great news of Christmas is that his strength is available to you. And that church, that is the thrill of hope that lasts all year long. Would you pray with me? Wow, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you for reminding us that this season is not just about this story that happened in Bethlehem. It's not even about all the amazing things that happened around your birth. It is about your desire to rescue and redeem through your love broken, jacked up, messed up people like me. And in that rescue mission, through our faith in you, as we take ownership of our faith in you, as we admit our need for your strength, not just in the big overwhelming stuff, but in the little daily struggles. As we align our lives with your purposes, and as we choose to act in faith, even though we don't feel it, that God, you pour out your unlimited, omnipotent power into the lives of people just like us. And we thank you, Jesus, that the cradle became a cross and the cross became a crown, and that in that we can truly celebrate this Christmas. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.